Well, hello, dragons, and welcome to this instructional video for Lesson 9, Part 1, The Roles of the President. The main idea behind this civics lesson is the president is the head of the executive branch of government, which is responsible for enforcing our country's laws. The president provides leadership by setting goals and developing policies. With that in mind, by the end of watching this video, you will be able to explain how the Constitution limits the power of the president, describe the president's role as head of the executive branch, summarize the president's role in military affairs and foreign policy, explain how the president influences the legislative and judicial branches, and identify presidential roles created by tradition. Now that the outcomes for this lesson have been shared with you, let's get started. Who is the leader of the United States? To most of us, the answer seems clear, the president. As our highest elected official, the president represents all Americans, not just citizens of one state or congressional district. It is the president who usually meets with leaders of other nations and whose daily activities are closely followed by the television networks, newspapers, and news magazines. Just about everyone knows who the president of the United States is. How many Americans, though, have a clear picture of what the president does? The president is the head of the executive branch, the branch of government responsible for executing or carrying out the laws. However, carrying out laws passed by Congress is only part of the president's job. The most important duty is to set goals for the nation and to develop policies, which are methods for reaching those goals. In spite of having many advisors, the president alone is responsible for making the final decisions about many important issues facing the nation. This heavy responsibility goes with an office that many think is the most powerful in the world. The office of president also has limits, though, which are set by the Constitution. To understand the powers and responsibilities of the presidency, as well as its limits, you need to look first at how the office was created. In creating the presidency, the framers did not want a leader with unlimited powers. The memory of the tyranny of the English king was fresh in the minds of many Americans. To calm the people's fears, the framers gave very few specific powers to the president. They also included ways to prevent abuse of power. One limit on the president's power is the term of office. The president is elected for a term of four years and must run for re-election in order to serve a second term. The 22nd Amendment says that no president may hold office for more than two terms. Another protection is the separation of powers among the three branches of government. The president may only carry out the laws. It is Congress that makes the laws. The Supreme Court has the power to decide if a law is constitutional. The system of checks and balances also limits the president's power. Many presidential decisions must be approved by Congress. In cases of serious wrongdoing, Congress may remove the president from office. Furthermore, the Supreme Court can decide whether actions taken by the president are allowed by the Constitution. To be president, a person must be at least 35 years old and a natural-born citizen of the United States. He or she must have lived in the United States for at least 14 years. The president's yearly salary, currently set at $400,000 per year, is set by Congress rather than by the Constitution. The framers knew that the nation needed a leader who could both carry out laws and represent the nation in meetings with leaders of other countries. However, the office of president was new in a world of nations led by monarchs. Therefore, the framers did not describe exactly how the president should fulfill the duties of this new office. Expecting that George Washington would be elected as the nation's first leader, they trusted that he would become a model of what a president should be. As Washington himself noted, I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent and made an example of. Through the examples of Washington and the presidents who followed him, the roles of the president have become more clearly defined over the years. The president serves as chief executive, or head of the executive branch. 
the Constitution states that the president must take care that the laws be faithfully executed. To execute laws means to make sure that they are carried out. Although Congress makes the laws, it is up to the executive branch officials to decide just how to carry out laws and other policies. As leader of the executive branch, the president usually makes only the broadest decisions, leaving the details to other officials. One way in which the president gives direction is through executive orders, which are rules or regulations that government officials must follow. In 1948, for example, President Harry Truman gave an executive order to end the segregation in the armed forces. After that, people of all races served together instead of in separate units. The power to make executive orders, however, is limited. The president's orders may not violate the Constitution or laws passed by Congress. As chief executive, the president also has the power to appoint about 4,000 executive branch officials. As a check on that power, Congress, specifically the Senate, must confirm or approve many top appointments. The Constitution says that the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. This statement points to the President's important role as leader of the armed forces. When the nation is at war, the President makes the most important decisions. To protect American interests, the President may send troops to a foreign country even if Congress has not declared war. However, the War Powers Resolution, passed after the Vietnam War, says that such troops may not remain for more than 60 days without the approval of Congress. The President is also our chief diplomat, the most important representative of the United States in relations with other nations. The President leads in making foreign policy, plans for guiding our nation's relationships with other countries. In general, foreign policy involves deciding how to support or oppose actions of other nations. Although they usually seek advice on foreign policy, presidents must make the final decisions. President Truman made that point when he said, I make foreign policy. Foreign policy is clearly the president's territory, but Congress may set limits. For instance, the president may make treaties or formal agreements with other countries, but the Senate may approve or reject any treaty. The President's appointments of ambassadors, the official representatives to foreign governments, must also be approved by the Senate. The President does have freedom, though, to make executive agreements, agreements with other countries, which do not need Senate approval. Executive agreements may have a wide range of purposes. They may set goals for trade or make promises to give aid to other countries. You have heard many times that Congress makes our nation's laws. The President, however, has a good deal of power to influence what those laws will be. The Constitution states that the President may recommend to Congress such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. This means that Congress is expected to consider the President's ideas rather than act alone in making laws. Early each year, the President gives a speech to both houses of Congress. In this State of the Union message, the President sets forth ideas about what America's foreign policy should be. The President also talks about problems at home, such as taxes, daycare, and pollution. By describing these problems and giving ideas for solving them, the President helps to set domestic policy, plans for dealing with national problems. So how does a President get Congress to turn foreign and domestic policy into laws? One way is by getting individual members of Congress to write bills. Another is by calling and meeting with members of Congress, urging them to support the President's program. Speeches to interest groups and to the public also help gain support for bills the President wants passed. A powerful tool for influencing Congress is the veto. Often just the threat of a veto is enough to get Congress to change a bill to make it more to the President's liking. Congress has overridden about 4% of the more than 2,500 votes in our nation's history. Another way in which the President acts as legislative leader is in making the budget. To put policy ideas into action costs money. Every year the President prepares a budget, a plan for how to raise and spend money 
to carry out the president's programs. Of course, Congress does not pass all the laws the president asks for, and it almost always makes changes in the president's budget. However, Congress cannot ignore the president's power as legislative leader. Finally, the president has the power to call special sessions of Congress if problems arise when Congress is not meeting. It also has the power to adjourn them. Today, however, Congress meets for almost the whole year, and the power is not much used. As part of the system of checks and balances, the President has several powers that affect the judicial branch. Most importantly, the President chooses Supreme Court justices and other federal judges. Of course, the President's power is balanced by the Senate, which must confirm these appointments. The President may limit the power of the judicial branch by putting off or reducing the punishment of someone convicted of a crime in federal courts. That's called a commutation. The president may even do away with the punishment by granting a pardon. Over the years, the president has taken on two other roles, party leader and chief of state. Neither role is mentioned in the Constitution, yet both are natural results of the president's power and position. The president is a member of a political party, typically either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. As our highest elected official, the President is seen as the leader of that party. The President's power and prestige can be used to support party goals or candidates. As Chief of State, though, the President speaks for the whole nation, expressing the values and goals of the American people. In this role, the President carries out many ceremonial duties, such as greeting visiting leaders and giving medals to citizens. As Chief of State, the President stands for a national unity that overshadows differences between the political parties. So there you have it with Lesson 9, Part 1, The Roles of the President. At this point, you should know that the presidency was created in a way to prevent an abuse of power, and George Washington established the model that future presidents have followed. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to have the entire catalog of civics videos available at your fingertips. Click the subscribe button and then click the follow bell to receive notifications as to when the channel is updated. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in class, dragons.